Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, we love you and we worship you today, Lord. Bless your name, God. God, we give you the highest praises tonight, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory. We give you glory, God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you for standing. We may be seated tonight. Ah. Amen. So, uh, we want to turn in our Bibles tonight to uh, the book of Jude. Uh, we're going we're gonna to stay in Jude chapter 1 tonight. <laughs> Seeing as how there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. I wasn't sure if any of you were listening. Jude chapter 1. And we want to begin with verse number three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. We'll skip down to verse number 20 and read right through to verse number 25. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and and forever. Amen. Praise God. I want to look at this, uh, the subject tonight, seven qualities of being beloved. In verse number three, uh, or rather verse number 20, G, uh, Jude said, but ye, uh, beloved, beloved. Now, the book of Jude is only one chapter long, but it's an extremely uh, powerful chapter. Uh, the book of Jude is a gripping chronicle of contrast. On one hand, we have the group that Jude calls the beloved, and the other hand, we have the outside, those outside of this group. Uh, Jude used such words as ungodly men, uh, deniers of God, unbelieving, backslidden fornicators, irreverent natural brute beasts, selfish, fruitless trees, raging shameful waves, wandering stars, destined to darkness, ungodly, murmuring sinners, manipulative, lust-filled mockers, sensual, empty isolationists. Uh, so, sandwiched in between our opening verse, this is what Jude describes. But then, in verse number 20, uh, Jude brings us back around to the beloved, the, the contrast. I don't know about you, but I want to be making sure that I am part of the beloved. I want God to consider me to be a beloved uh, member of his church, of his kingdom. Now, it really does make a difference uh, whether or not you are a part of this group. Malachi chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, it said, Ye have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept our or this ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call upon the proud happy, yea, they that uh, work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So it truly does make a difference to God how you live and uh, how you believe and what you do with your life and if you're part of the beloved or not. Now tonight we want to look at seven qualifications drawn from uh, these verses in Jude that uh, I think really kind of go into factoring what makes a person a part of the beloved of God. I found the first one in verse number 1, or rather verse 20. And the first thing that the beloved will do is they will build. 
but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. God's beloved are builders for eternity. Building a strong structure uh, essentially requires three things. If you were to build a natural building, you first of all will need a plan, unless you just want to build some sort of shack. But we're not building a shack, we're building something that's got to last for eternity. So we need a plan. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. So the pattern that we have, thank God, is the Bible. So that's the plan. And then the foundation also, uh, we find in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, and ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the plan and the foundation. And then the third thing that you need if you're going to build uh, a building is you need a building. You need to actually build the building. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's hubs- husbandry. Ye are God's building. So if we were to look at the foundation as being Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, which is the plan of salvation, we can look at the building itself being uh, the Christian act of perfecting Christianity, uh, making, becoming perfected in Christ. That's what really the building is all about. And we've got to build according to the way the, that Moses had, was admonished in the word of the Lord as, as far as the plan is concerned. So. Part, being a part of the uh, beloved, you, you're going to be a builder. You're going to build. Secondly, we find also in verse 20, Jude said, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves uh, in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. The second thing you will do if you are a part of the beloved is you will pray. Uh, it will be something that you will do. Now, there are some problems with prayer. Uh, as a pastor, I look out sometimes and I see uh, people not praying, and I want to go and shake them but I can't do that. Uh, I'd like to, but um, hopefully this word can shake somebody tonight because prayer is essential. If you don't pray, you can't make it to heaven. It's just, it's not going to happen. That's our connection to God. But there's some problems with prayer uh, if we don't do prayer correctly. Slackness can be a problem with prayer. In other words, a lack of prayer. James chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, you have not because you ask not. So just simply not praying, that's a problem or not praying enough. Another problem with prayer is selfishness. Sometimes uh, that can be the problem. James 4, verse 3, it says, Ask, ye ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. Uh, Another problem with prayer is shallowness. In other words, we're not really digging in to what God, the, the, the important things about prayer. Jesus addressed this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. Therefore take no thought, saying, What we shall eat, or what we shall drink, wherewithal we shall be clothed. So that's just the fundamental stuff. Don't worry about that stuff. Don't spend all your time praying about that sort of stuff. For after these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. So what do we do? What's deep prayer? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. So if we focus our prayer uh, upon the important things, then God will take care of the stuff that is necessary, but not really all that important com- considering eternity. And another problem with prayer is spiritless prayer, not praying in the Holy Ghost. Um, Jesus told Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So we cannot generate, expect to have revenues in the Spirit uh, if we are sowing, you know, investing in our flesh. We've got to get into the Spirit if we want to reap of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 3, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And again in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So uh, slackness of prayer, selfish prayer, shallow prayer, and also spiritless prayer, these are all problems with prayer. But Jude said, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's how we build up ourselves in our most holy faith, is by praying in the Holy Ghost, getting with it with God. We all know what that's, that feels like. And uh, we also all know what it feels like when you're not doing that. It's just not the same. 
So the third thing we can find uh, beyond building and praying, we can find the word keep uh, mentioned here. Verse 21, it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, how do you do that? How do you keep yourself in the love of God? John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the best and the most biblical and sound way to keep yourself in God's love is make sure that you're staying in the parameters of God's word. You're walking that straight, narrow line, that path to heaven to the best of your ability. That's how you keep yourself in God's love. Because uh, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. Now the word keep comes from a Greek word teros, which means to watch or guard from loss or injury by keeping an eye upon to prevent escaping which implies a fortress or full military lines of apparatus. So it's not a lackadaisical falling asleep at, on the watch type of keeping, but it's being vigilant, being sober, being diligent about um, keeping yourself in the love of God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, For we were made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So the most important thing is not just beginning the journey with Jesus, but finishing it and continuing it. The most safest way to finish it is just to be faithful all the way through. If you, if you never backslide, then you'll never backslide. Um, Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. That's one of those understatements, I think, in Scripture. There's a lot of understatements in Scripture where, if you think about it, these things are good and profitable unto men. Yeah, if it means heaven or hell, I'd say that that's pretty profitable and good. Um, We keep ourselves in the love of God also by maintaining a love relationship with Jesus. Uh, And that's, again, all linked into building and praying and uh, and that Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Think about how it was if some of you were married, how great it was when you were first married. And, and it still is, honey. But uh, that's the honeymoon. You can't stay on your honeymoon your entire life. Uh, that's just the way it is. But with Jesus, we've got to have that first love. We've got to keep that honeymoon going. Uh, we really do try need to do that. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, um, speaking to the church of Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Notice it, you know, we sometimes misquote, at least I've heard it misquoted, we've lost our first love, like it was like you've lost a set of keys or something. This is not talking, this is a leaving of the first love. It's a, it's a deliberate choices that were made to leave it behind. Well, how do you do that? Well, you make other choices. You, you, you take the love of God and you say, well, that's not that important to me right now. This is more important to me. Um, and then you leave it behind. So that's not a good thing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous, will will give me, uh, and not to me only, but also all them who love his appearing. So we see that the beloved will be builders, they will be prayers, they will be keepers. Another word that we find here is uh, looking. They will be lookers. Uh, Verse number 21, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms chapter 33, verses 18 through 19, behold, The eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. So God's eye is upon them that hope in his mercy. They're looking for his mercy. Um, Looking for mercy, really, uh, it's, it's found in three tenses, you could say, in Scripture. There's the past mercy of God, there's present mercy, and there's also future mercy that we have to be looking for and keeping our eye upon. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us endured the cross. So we can look back in time 
at an cr- old rugged cross and we can see that, that that's the mercy of God. It still is affecting me today. And we can look in the present as well. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. So looking diligently in this present time and then also looking forward uh, into the future. Uh, Titus chapter 2, Two and verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's something that we got to keep our minds on. If we, if we do think about the coming of the Lord, it tends to help us to really live a, a better and more pure life. Because any man that has this hope in himself pures, purifies himself even as he is pure. So we see the words building, praying, keeping, looking, there's another key word that I think goes into being a part of the beloved, and that is, of course, love. If, if you're going to be a part of the beloved, you would think that that would make sense. Verse 22, some have compassion, making a difference. So that compassion does stand to reason that uh, to those beloved of God should also themselves be dispensers of love. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19 that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So having that dimensional love in your heart for God, for others, We need the fullness. We need the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost um, in order to really fulfill that kind of a height, depth, breadth, width type of love. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or perfection. Being the, to be perfect, we've got to put on, the first thing we've got to do is put on love. Make sure that everything that we are doing in our life decisions that we make, the things that are motivating us is, is a heart of love, not selfish reasons or vain glory or what it, things like along those lines. But above all of these things, put on charity, the Apostle Paul said. Uh, and uh, Jude said, having compassion, making a difference. So that kind of love is what can really make a difference in people's lives. Uh, you know, you've probably heard it said before. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So uh, that type of love is going to make a difference. And um, so love. Uh, And number six, we can find another word here. Save. Verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Saving others with fear. I think that in order to be a part of God's beloved, we've got to have a heart for the harvest. We've got to have a heart for saving souls, for witnessing. We don't save souls so much as he's the savior, but we are to be called to be witnesses, to be tellers of the truth, to be sharers of the gospel. And if we do that, then we are doing the work of God. James chapter 5 and verse 20, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death. That's a profound thing. I mean, think about the most profound things that people can do in their life, that's got to be at the very top of it. If you can affect somebody's eternity, that's, that's the most powerful thing that we as human beings could possibly do. And, it, and the terminology that Jude uses here is pulling them, pulling them from the fire, like grabbing them. You know, those people that are about to fall into an eternal volcano, you're pulling them from the fire. You're saving them. It's dramatic stuff. Um, God is not interested in saving the lost. He wants to save the lost. We're not here to placate and to play games and to, you know, we've really, there's not that much time left. We have to really be, um, the world is very forceful. The, the world is in your face. They're, they don't hold anything back trying to, drag people to hell we i I really what i'm really feeling right now is like we need we need boldness we need to ask god for boldness to be able to just uh get it out there without fear praise god without 
you know, fear of how people are going to think of you or look at you or treat you. Who cares about any of that stuff? You know, if you can win a person from, uh, for God, it's just uh, everything else doesn't matter. And the last thing we, we can see here, we can see building, praying, keeping, looking, loving, saving. And the last thing is praise. Verse number 25, Jude closes with the only wise God, our Savior, to be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. He ends that chapter, or that, that one chapter book that he wrote on praise, praising that God who's worthy of all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. And it uh, makes sense again, if we're going to be, if God is, looks at us as his beloved, people that he really loves, then we have to be always looking to him with that same heart of love and adoration and worship. Uh, to the beloved, praise is, not a, is, is about the most natural activity that, that they can do. Um, uh, Psalms chapter 33 and verse 1, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise is comely for the upright. So people that are saved by the Lord, uh, that word comely in the NIV translation means fitting. In the Amplified Version, it says that praise is appropriate. And the New King James Version says uh, praise is beautiful for the upright. It's all of those things. It's comely, fitting, appropriate, and beautiful. Um, it's beautiful witnessing creatures in the natural element, like the eagle soaring in the sky. It's like there's, it just makes sense. It just looks like it should be that way. A dolphin uh, soaring, kind of leaping through the, the ocean, or a cheetah running just, uh, just full tilt on the, on the African plain. Uh, that always seems appropriate. That always seems in order to see them behaving the way they should in their environment. And it, we should always be able to look out over a Pentecostal church service and see worshipers because that's the most natural thing. That's just uh, as natural as breathing for people to respond to God with all of the good things that God has done for them and does on a regular basis uh, and that we would respond to him in praise and worship. We want to close with this verse, and then we'll open it up for a little bit of discussion. Uh, Psalms chapter 149, verses 1 through 4. Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise the na his name and dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and the harp, for the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. Praise the Lord. So I want to be a part of the Beloved, and I want to stay a part of the Beloved. Any questions or comments? It's good to see um, the LaFive kids, or some of them, a portion, a fraction of them. The girls, or just the girls. Indeed, they are girls. Praise God. It's good to be back in the basement. Amen. Wow. No questions, comments? Additive. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 Amen. Well, for the people that have been tuning in here, uh, we kind of had a late start on it uh, today. So next week, we're going to encourage everybody. Uh, we want to pretend that this doesn't start at 7, but it starts at 6.45. So when we get here, we'll pray for the food, we'll have fellowship, and then by the time 7 o'clock rolls around, we'll be ready to start our Bible study immediately. 
and uh, and with with a song, and and then we'll jump right in, so that uh, we're not, you know, it's just a better way of dealing. So can we all do that next week, six forty-five? That's when we, well, get here before that for prayer, and you won't have a problem with that. So six thirty prayer, six forty-five we're gonna have uh, fellowship time, and then Bible studies right away. So let's just close in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for this uh, word that we have tonight. Thank you for the privilege of allowing us to worship you in spirit and truth and be here in, in, uh, in the building once again for our Bible study. We pray that you would bless every heart, God, as we go with you. Lord, help us to always live our lives in a way that we can be the beloved, that you would be happy with us, that you would be pleased with the way that we are doing Christianity, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus that you do it. Touch every heart, God. Touch every mind. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for it, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord.